Simenon's Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon. Jules, my friend, you look... What is it? Guilty. Well, I feel guilty, Georges. Very guilty. Although what the hell about, I don't know. Something on the conscience? Or the liver? Oh, I have plenty on my conscience. And as for my liver... Now, all it is is that I've been talking to a friend of my wife's who was a woman with a perpetual hard-done-by aura around her. You know the sort. Who doesn't? <laughs> she reminded me of Longyon. Yes. yes, of course. Inspector Longyon of the second Paris district. Mm, the very essence of the hard-done-by. Oh, yes, I remember him. Thin and hatchet-faced. Paul Lognon. <laughs> Good policeman, you know, for all that. Wonderfully thorough. Maigret and the young girl. Didn't you have one particular case where you and Lognon followed one another around? Oh, that happened more than once. But I think I know the case you mean. That poor young girl, found in Longyon's district, on the pavement of the Place Vintimille, at three o'clock on a March morning. This is the Place Blanche. The Place Vintimille is the first on the right, Chief. Good. I should be in bed. Do you know that, young jean -Vier? Yes, Chief. Oh, so should you. Ah. Hmm. There they are. Oh, Lord. Of course. Chief? Inspector Longion. It's his patch. There he is, looking as happy as ever. Shall I drive on? No, he's seen us, was expecting us, probably. Have to face it. Good morning, Inspector Longion. Good morning, Chief Inspector. Did they ring you at home? No, I was still at the Quai des Affaires when the call came through. Just thought I'd take a look. Well, there she is. Very dead. Mm. Found about ten minutes ago. Uh, oh, who is she? No handbag, no papers. One shoe's missing. Have you come across it? No, and she had no coat. Uh, an evening dress, isn't it? Uh, bring the light nearer, will you? Mm -hmm. uh, good. Ah. Uh. She's pathetic. Ah, oh, poor kid. Poor little girl. jean Vier. Yes, Chief? Get the photographer along, will you? The sooner we have a picture of her, the better. Right, Chief. Well, I'd say she wasn't killed here. Well, you're probably right, Longyon. It's a funny place to dump a body, isn't it? Well, it's quiet here. I'd say she came by car. Yeah, but a body would soon be found. If there was a car, why not... Put her in the river, find some waste ground, hide her. Well, I've no idea. Oh. Uh, she breaks my heart, you know that? She's got the face of a... <laughs> a sulky child. You know her? Well, if she's one of the street girls, she's very new. I know pretty well all of them, but I've not seen her. Well, we must find out who she is. I shall need your help. Yeah, I thought you'd be taking the case over. Mind you, I'm not complaining. I'm pretty well used to it. Look, I'll still need your help, and it's your patch. All right, if you say. Good. Uh, you'd better start by asking questions. Are the clubs still open? Most are. They don't close in general until about four. And I'll be on my way. All right. Good morning, Inspector Lognon. Good morning, Inspector Javier. Yeah. Uh, the doctor's just arrived. Yeah. The photographer's on his way, Chief. Good. Uh, I'm going to find some food. Meet me at the morgue at, say, half past four. Mm. Our good Dr. Paul should have something for us by then. 
she was between 19 and 22 years old, in good health, but I'd say rather undernourished. Now, was she a sweet girl, would you say, Doctor? Oh, not this one, no. She'd never been to bed with anyone. Uh, uh, how did she die? A uh, fracture of the skull. Uh, she was struck three violent blows by something heavy, a tool or a cosh, mm. and before she was hit, she was slapped on the face quite hard a number of times. I think she fell on her knees first and tried to cling to someone. So she wasn't attacked from behind? Oh, no. Hmm. What do her hands tell you? Her hands? Oh, yes. Um, I don't think she'd ever done any real work. No typing or dressmaking or working in a factory. And uh, well, she'd done very little housework to speak of. I see. Oh, you'll let me have your report later today, will you? Oh, of course, Megre. Uh, but one thing you may like to know now. Hmm? Uh, she had her last meal at about seven last night. She died around two this morning, and sometime just before her death, she consumed a good deal of alcohol, mm. enough to leave her fairly unsober, I'd say. So, we have a dead, drunken virgin on our hands. Perhaps she'd been to a party, Chief. Yeah, it's quite likely she had. Well, thanks, Dr. Bull. Uh, thank you, Megre. Uh, I'll find out what it was she drank and put it in my report. Right. Well, young Jean Vier, what do her clothes tell us? Uh, something, Chief. Uh, the dress has a tag on it. Huh? Irene, 35, Rue de Douai. Just round the corner from the Place Fantimie. Well, that's something indeed. <laughs> oh, it'll soon be dawn. I'm going to get some sleep. Uh, you too. A photograph will appear in the second edition. Somebody will recognize her, I hope. I'll get hold of Longion and visit Irene's in the afternoon. This is the shop, Chief Inspector. <laughs> Not exactly haute couture, is it? Irene, model gowns. She hires gowns out as well as selling. You probably know Lorient. Who is she? Elizabeth Kumar. Ah, <laughs> there's not much you don't know about this area, is there? I didn't know the dead girl. Well, who did? I take it nobody knew her in the club. I would have told you if they had. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I shall go around them again before they close tonight with a picture of the girl this time. That's the stuff. So, let's have a word with Madame Mireille. Did you get some sleep? Not much. The wife's unwell, as usual. Madame Mireille? She's Mademoiselle. Who are you? The Chief Inspector Maigret. Are you? I know who you are, misery guts. Oh, shut up, you young cow. Where's Mademoiselle Kumar? Where'd you think after lunch? Well, go and wake her up. It's important. She won't like it. Nice girl. Yeah, she's her usual sort. Kumar calls them protégé. Mm. Saves them from the streets, I suppose. Uh, did you see the pictures of the dead girl in the morning papers? Yeah, he's got one here. It's very recognisable, even with the bruises. Somebody will know her. Ah, she's awake. <laughs> Drinks like a fish. Yes, yeah, so our dead girl had been drinking. Rum, Dr. Paul reckons. Uh, why, I wonder? And who would want to kill such a child? Why? I never think of it. What good does it do? Very little, usually, I know, but this girl... To know who she was... Ah, what are you after this time? This is Chief Inspector Magnan. Oh, I've heard of him. What's he doing with you? Inspector Longyon has a dress of yours. Mm. This one. Hired out, I'd say. Mm. Yes, I heard it out last night. I don't know her name, but I got a coat and dress because she had no money for the deposit. Vivian, my pet, get her clothes. Now, what time was this, mademoiselle? Oh, about nine. <laughs> You're a fine figure of a man, aren't you? <clears throat> <clears throat> about nine. We don't close till ten. Eight till ten's our busiest time. <laughs> Surprising number of girls suddenly find they need a dress for the night then. These <laughs> are old things. Coat. <clears throat> Homemade dress, handbag. Ah, oh, give me the handbag. Mm, beside the dress, what else did you hire, mademoiselle? Oh, Dewey, how polite he is, old long yarn. Yeah. A velvet cape and a little silver evening bag with a chain to it. Uh, yeah, well, there's only a pencil and a pair of gloves in this well, one. Well, naturally, she transferred things to the evening bag. What's happened to the cape and the bag? They've gone missing. The girl who hired them was killed early this morning. Oh, silly girl getting killed. 
Have a look at her picture. Mm. You've no idea who she was? Oh, that's her. She got bashed up. Oh, I never knew who she was, but I remembered her, though, when she came in last night. So did Vivian, didn't she? The stuck-up thing she was, mm. like when she'd come in about a month ago for a dress. She hired that one then. Oh, she came in in the evening that time, too. She had some money and paid the deposit and brought it back the next day. Now, last night, mademoiselle, oh. did she ask for that particular dress? She did. Oh, lucky I had it in. She changed here and left soon after nine. I watched her go down the street. Funny sort of girl. Well, was she nervous? Excited? Anything? Oh, she was like a girl in desperate need of a dress. You mean it was important to her? I mean, Miss Yates, always important to them. They're all the same. They must have a dress pronto or they'll die. She did. Come in. Ah, good morning, jean -Vier. Anything? Morning, Chief. Nothing. Not a sausage. Hmm. Oh, somebody must have known her. She must have lived somewhere. Well, she hired an evening dress. She must have gone somewhere in it. Pictures of her, descriptions of her, have now appeared in... How many? Five morning papers yesterday and six this morning. Seen by millions, if we can believe the circulation figures. Well, God, she's been dead for over 24 hours. Somebody must have missed her. Chief. Hmm? Go on. I was thinking, if she was so hard up that she couldn't afford the deposit, even for a tatty old evening dress, yeah. she must have needed it to hire it for something really important, if you see what I mean. Mm, something important like borrowing money? Yes, that makes sense. Uh, so on the other hand, I asked Madame Maigret last night why a girl would behave like our girl. Uh, she said that a woman can have a sudden desire to dress up without a serious reason. Like small girls do. That's <laughs> it. Our girl, did she look that type to you, Chief? No, no, she was a... a lost little creature. I have to try to know her, jean Vier, and then I shall know how and why she died. Mm. Maigre. Uh, I've something to tell you about the girl who's been murdered. Uh, have you? Uh, good, uh, what's your name? Well, where, Rose? 113 Rue de Clichy, mm -hmm. on the second floor, with old Madame Crémier, who won't help you. But, Goodbye. But, what? Well, oh, come on, jean -Vier. we've got to lead at last. The Rue de Clichy and Madame Crémier. Madame Crémier, you do recognise the girl, don't you? Oh, yes, that's her, all right. And she was your lodger since when? Monsieur, she was not my lodger. She was a girl to whom I gave a room. Gave a room to? She paid me something, of course. Hmm. Oh, what's the use? You just sit there without any expression. You know perfectly well, monsieur, if I take a person in as a lodger, the inland revenue people want to know about it, so I call them friends, and they pay something. Uh, what goes on between the inland revenue and yourself has nothing to do with me, madame. Now, tell me about the girl. Her name? Louise Laboine was the name she gave me, but I never saw her identity card. She answered my discreet notice in the newsagent shop in January. She seemed a nice, well-bred, quiet girl, so I said, do come and stay. Did you know where she worked? Worked? I have no idea. She never said. She never said anything, as I soon found out, monsieur. And she was the most unsociable, unfriendly girl you could ever come across. Small wonder she seemed to have no friends. Work. <laughs> at first she left at 8.30 in the morning. Then after a few weeks it was 9.00. Sometimes she'd stay in bed all morning. I asked her if she changed her job, but she wouldn't say. Wouldn't say? What did she say? She said nothing. That was her way. When she didn't want to answer a question, she would pretend not to have heard it and only look at one blankly and turn away. It was infuriating. Eh? Here's Rose, Chief. Ah, thank you, jean -Vier. Uh, Come in, Rose. Madame Cremier, this is Inspector jean -Vier. You're very young for an inspector, monsieur. Thank you, madame. Mm. And why is Rose with you? A rose, madame, was public spirited enough to ring us and tell us where the dead girl lived. She had no right to interfere. It was no business of yours, Rose. Why not? Because you'd kicked her out. Because you didn't want anything more to do with her. When did you kick her out, madame Cremier? I asked her to leave three days ago. She hadn't paid. Uh, the rent. Did she take her things with her? As a matter of fact, she didn't. When I told her to leave as soon as possible, she said, very well. 
That was all. And she went out and didn't come back. Mm. Will you take Inspector Jean Vier to her room, please? Jean Vier, put her things together. Yes, Chief. This way, Inspector. I'll show you what she left. Thank you, madame. <sighs> well, Rose, come here. Uh, thank you for ringing us. Well, she wasn't going to. That's why I did. I overheard her talking to the concierge. Well, they must have been looking at the picture in the paper. And old Mother Cremier said that was the wretched girl, all right. And she wasn't surprised she met a bad end. But she wasn't going to ring. Well, she said the police were paid well enough without people doing their work for them. Mm. Well, so I rang. Uh, well, tell me, Rose, did you know Louise well? Oh, no. Well, she sometimes used to smile at me. I worked for a family on the first floor, see, and, well, we used to meet on the stairs, and I used to see her sitting in the gardens, and... Ah, was she waiting for somebody? Well, nobody ever came. Well, she'd get up and go, and half an hour later come back and sit down, but I never saw her with anybody. Mm. Well, she was so pretty, like a film actress. But, but she always looked unhappy, as if she never laughed. Do you suppose she knew she was going to die? No, Rose, I... I think it was her life that was unhappy. It's all here in a suitcase. What there is of it? <laughs> Excuse me, Rose. Oh, yeah. here we are. Two slips, mm. two pants, pair of stockings, dressing gown, hairbrush, box of face powder, some aspirin. It's pathetic, Chief. Yes. No letters, postcards? Nothing. That's all she had except for one dress, a pair of shoes and an old coat. And she behaved as if she was worth a fortune. She didn't even have a nightdress. Look, did you discover anything about her, madame? Where she came from, if she had parents still alive? Once when I said something about the South, she implied that she knew Nice quite well. Nice? Hmm. And you never saw her with anybody and nobody came here? Nobody came or telephoned. She went out some evenings. Well, to the cinema, certainly, because I found the tickets. Well, thank you. We'll take her things. Uh, jean Vier, when you get back to the quay, put through a call to Inspector Ferret at Nice. Get them to put the photos in their papers. Right, Chief. I must meet old Longion. See what he's dug up. A glass of the dry white, Pierre. Uh, at once, Chief Inspector. Oh, and uh, Chief Inspector, there's someone waiting for you over in the corner. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Hello, you What'll you have? Whatever you choose, Chief Inspector. Of course. A cognac, then, Pierre. Uh, I'll bring them over, monsieur. Thank you. Have you been here long? Oh, it doesn't matter. I managed a few hours sleep. Uh, out all night? Until five. Tell me about it. I did what I said I would. I went over the same ground as the night before, only more thoroughly. And this time I had the girls' pictures. Until three o'clock, four minutes past, to be precise, ah. I had no luck. Uh, white wine for you, Chief. Uh, uh, cognac, monsieur. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Cognac? Probably goes straight to my head. Good. Ah, here's health. Here's hoping. <clears throat> hmm. Now, four minutes past three, to be precise. Yes. Outside the Le Grello, I spoke with a taxi driver, Leon Ziak. I showed him the photos, and he recognised her at once. On the night of her death, he was waiting opposite a new nightclub, the Romeo, in the Rue Comartin. And? That night, the Romeo was the scene of a wedding party. Ah, was it? Well, go on. I checked on it. Came across this newspaper cutting covering mm. the event. It tells us that one Marco Santoni, the representative in France for a brand of Italian vermouth, Married Janine Armagnier of Paris two days ago, and the wedding party was held at Romeo's. Mm, Santoni is not a member of the Italian mafia, I hope. I asked records, they've no trace of him. Oh. Oh, he's a rich man of 45, a member of the smart set, who's had many mistresses, but this is his first marriage. Right, uh, get back to the dead girl. Yeah, I was about to. The taxi driver, Leon Zirk, saw her leave Romeo's at a quarter past twelve. He asked her if she wanted a taxi, but she ignored him. Well, it was night. Is he sure it was her? There's enough neon to make it like day around Romeo's. Zirk also noticed that she was wearing a shabby blue evening dress. And there's something else. Ah, is her. Zirk was engaged a little later by a couple to go to the Etoile. And after he'd set them down on his way back, 
Much to his surprise, he saw the girl walking down the Boulevard Haussmann, going towards the Champs-Élysées. He looked at his watch. It was almost one o'clock. Hmm? Oh, uh, good work, Longyard. Now, I'm sure you checked at Romeo. I spoke to the doorman and the head barman, and they both recalled her well. The doorman let her in just before 12. She'd no invitation card, but said she was a friend of the bride's and looked so harmless. And once inside? The head barman noticed her at once. She was different from the smart set the other guests belonged to. At first, she stood by the bar watching the dancing, and then during the interval, she caught the bride's eye and went up to her, and they talked for some minutes. Mm, what was the atmosphere like? And Madame Santoni, it seems, was pretty reserved, cold even, and shook her head, no, a number of times, but she did put something into the girl's hand, something from her handbag. Money? The man couldn't be sure, but he thought it was. And soon after that, the girl left. With enough money on her to be killed for it? Mm. What was Madame Santoni's maiden name? Jeanine Armenu. Do we know anything about her? She's no record. We must get hold of her. She's at present on her honeymoon in Italy. Ah. So you've made some inquiries? I went to Santoni's flat in the Rue de Berry this morning and spoke to his manservant. Apparently Santoni met Jeanine four or five months ago. She didn't belong to the circles he moved in, and the fellow never has discovered where and how his master met her. I gather she's in her early 20s, hard-headed, attractive, with a temper, ah. and was living at the Hotel Washington before her marriage. Uh, Santoni paid for the hotel. Uh, did the manservant know Louise Labois? Louise Labois? Yeah. The dead girl. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry, old chap. I, I should have said before. No. We found where she lived, up to three days ago, anyway, this morning. The girl recognised her picture and phoned us. She was known as Louise Labois, and it's possible she came from Nice, Jean Vier's chick. And this girl who recognised her knew all about her, I suppose. No, she never spoke to her. Nobody knew a thing about her. Now, I can only hope that your Janine Armagnier will know something. Did the manservant know Louise? No. He was sure she'd never come to St. Tony's flat. Hmm. Well, thank you, Longyon. Fine work. Uh, another cognac. No, thank you, Chief Inspector. I have a few more inquiries I'd like to make about Janine Armagnier, where she lived before the hotel and so on. So, uh, if you'd excuse me... Yes. I remained there in the bar trying to understand. Do you understand, my dear Georges? What you were trying to understand? I think so. And I've seen you before when you're concentrating in that manner. Yeah, I know. My poor wife has suffered for years. But this girl, Louise... It somehow become very close to me. If I had a daughter, this sort of girl, why should she die? The way she did. A girl who came to Paris, is alone in Paris, knows not a soul but Janine Santoni. And Janine, by all accounts, is a very different sort of girl from Louise. So they probably knew each other before Paris. Could be. Louise has no money, no prospects, no job, and nowhere to live. She was kicked out by Madame Cremieux in the morning, surfaced in the evening at Irene's, went to a wedding party at midnight, was seen walking in Paris at one in the morning... And was dead by two. So there is an hour to fill in. And during that hour, she drank quite a bit of rum. Mm, so she went to a bar. I can't see her walking into a bar at that time of the morning alone. Can you? Perhaps somebody was with her. Well, according to Longyon's taxi driver, she was alone at one. Now, perhaps she had a reason for going into a bar. And what would that have been? I had no idea. Well, for a couple of days, old Longyon ploughed his way through Janine's immediate past. I didn't want to get the young lady back from her honeymoon unless all else failed, but then the police at Nice turned up trumps. So at last there was some background. Oh, there was of a bizarre variety. A mother. I went to Nice to see her. She was an addict. Mm -hmm. A gambling addict, hooked on the wheel. I had to interview her in the casino. <laughs> Dead, you say? Murdered? Well, I hope she didn't suffer too much. Oh, red again, and yesterday the black came up nine times out of ten. She left home four years ago. 
I never heard from her more than a couple of times. She once sent me an address, care of a Janine, somebody or other. I never knew her. Janine. No. I used to be a dancer, you know. Polly Berger, South America, Middle East. I met her father in Istanbul, a Dutchman, Julius van Kram. Ah, look, the black for once. I might break even today after all. Oh, yeah, later, I suddenly found myself pregnant. I decided to have it. Louise was born here in Nice. Two months after she was born, Van Kram walked out one afternoon to buy cigarettes and never came back. I never saw him again. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes. Sent me money over the years. Asked for news of Louise. I always wrote to him, poached rest on to calls to every city in the world. Last time I heard from him, about a year ago, sent a large money order and wanted to know Louise's address, so I sent her the one in care of Janine, whoever. Uh, he was in New York. <laughs> I don't know what he did, but I'm sure it wasn't honest. <laughs> ah, red again. You're bringing me poor luck, Monsieur Maigret. There was your sought for background, Jules. No mm. wonder Louise left it as soon as she could. And no wonder it left her neurotically unsociable. It still didn't explain anything. What she could have been murdered for and who could have murdered her. No, but it gave you just the hint of a lead, surely. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, she did. Julius Van Kram. He took a bit of tracing, but within 24 hours, records had a dossier on him. Confidence trickster? Of some notoriety. Known under 20 different names in 20 different countries. The, the last name had been Donley, and under that name he'd been sentenced to eight years in the United States for fraud. And he died in prison nine months before his daughter was killed. He wrote asking for her address from prison, didn't he? Well, he wrote during the trial or just before. I spoke to the FBI, and they told me that the proceeds of Van Kram's last fraud were never recovered. Over $100,000. So what was your next step, Jules? A criminal connection had been discovered, and one that the girl knew nothing of, presumably. But it led nowhere. Right. Now I had to speak to Janine Santoni, bring her back from her honeymoon. I uh, thought she might be cross, so I sent Longion on ahead to see her first. I myself turned up half an hour later. She was an aggressive-looking redhead with a magnificent figure and a magnificent temper to match. Ah, so you finally condescended to make an appearance, Monsieur Maigret. I'm sorry, Madame Santoni. I'm sure Inspector Longon has explained. Oh, I have explained, Chief Inspector. Madame Santoni, however... Has refused to answer any questions. Now, why won't you answer Inspector Longon's questions, Madame? Have you something to hide? Of course I have. What woman hasn't? Well, my questions were not at all personal, I can assure you, Chief Inspector. They referred entirely to her relationship with the dead girl. I didn't answer his stupid questions because I felt that a woman of my social standing should be questioned by the leading Chief Inspector, not by a subordinate. A social standing, yes, of course. <laughs> Inspector Longyo is not strictly a subordinate of mine. He is from a different district. The district in which Louise Laboin was found dead. Well, the man looks like a subordinate. Well, the chief inspector was only being tactful. The chief inspector will become less tactful unless you both stop being ridiculous. Good. Now, madame, how old are you? Hardly a day over 20, I'd say. <laughs> 21, monsieur. And do you want the age of my grandmother? In a moment. I shall call you Jeanine. It suits you. Tell me about Louise, Jeanine. Have you known her long? Four years. She was 16, I was 17. We, we both left home. We met on the night train from Nice to Paris. We had to sit up all night, so we told each other our life stories. In Paris, at first, you stay with your aunt in the Rue de Chemin Vert. You left after a few months after a quarrel about a girl whom your aunt found under your bed. So, you've seen my aunt, have you? Well, you don't want to believe all she said about me. Look, I didn't come to Paris just to work in an office or a shop or to marry a clerk or a shop assistant. The girl under your bed, I take it, was Louise. Naturally. Everything connected with Louise was disaster. She lost the job she had in a shop in no time. 
she said the boss made a pass at her. <laughs> so she was slung out of her cheap hotel. She turned up at my place and asked to stay. I hid her in my room, and when my aunt came in, she went under the bed. <laughs> my aunt might have taken pity on her, but when she found Louise, huh, being Louise, she wasn't even apologetic or anything, just coldly matter-of-fact, huh, insolent almost. Mm, you then took a flat in the Rue de Pontieu. And Louise came too. I didn't want her. It wasn't always convenient for me to have her there. <laughs> She didn't seem to mind. She'd sit in the tiny kitchen for hours. Did she find another job? Oh, she had various jobs. None of them any good. None of them lasted more than a few weeks. Louise wasn't trained to do anything, and I honestly think she didn't want to do anything. Oh, she was pathetic, Monsieur Maigret. People said she was shy, but uh, that wasn't the truth. She had no love for life. Perhaps that was what it was. Mm. And how long did you stick together, Eugenie? Almost three years, and stick is the word as far as Louise was concerned. She never paid a penny towards the rent, and, oh, in the end, we were not speaking terms. Then I met Marco, my husband, and I moved out and went to a hotel. So she had to leave the flat. I don't know where she went, and I didn't care. Did you see her again before the night of the wedding? No, but she tried to see me. My husband took me to Maxime's a lot, and that got into the gossip columns. She turned up there one evening, the head waiter told us, you know, wearing a, a tatty old blue dress. Oh, typically Louise asked for us, and when she was told we weren't there, just walked out without a word. Uh, she came to your wedding party in the same dress. It was hired. And it looked like it. She wasn't invited, of course. Oh, she looked quite awful. Now, what did she want? Money, of course. I tried to tell her I couldn't help her. Now, I was married. It was different, my husband didn't want me to have anything to do with her in future. But you gave her something, didn't you? What I had in my bag and... Oh, and I told her about the letter, which is why she left at once, I imagine. A letter from the United States, was it? I don't know. Uh, this one was left by a man. Uh, I was coming to the letter, Chief Inspector. You do dig around, don't you? <laughs> doesn't he? He's a good detective. <laughs> Go on, lawyer. A man with an American accent spoke to the receptionist at the Hotel Washington about Louise Laboin and Janine Armagneux. He'd been trying to trace Laboin for some weeks and got to the Washington about ten days ago. Two days later, he came back, said he had to leave Paris, and left a letter for Laboin, care of Mademoiselle Armagneux, as she then was. Did you give Louise the letter, Janine? How uh, could I? I had no idea where she was, and I, I didn't have it with me at my wedding. But you do still have it. And somewhere in the flat. Look, I was preparing for my marriage, monsieur. <laughs> my husband made me open it, though. He was suspicious of it. Italian men are very jealous. Now, what did it say? Oh, roughly, uh, not word for word. Um, uh, I have a very important message for you. I must see you as soon as possible. Ask for me, um, uh, Jimmy, at Pickwick's bar in the Rue de l'Etoile. Oh, and then there was a sort of postscript. Uh, I have to leave Paris. I'm leaving the paper with a man who runs Pickwick's. Uh, Albert. Uh, he'll ask you to prove your identity. It's important. That was all. Ah, well, I'll go to Pickwick's bar. I know Albert. He has a record. The bar is used by some of the Corsican fraternity. Get what you can out of him. I'll be along as soon as I can. I'll have a pair now, Albert. Uh, yes, Monsieur Maigret, a uh, pair now. Where is she? Oh, Lognon. Mm. Oh, we left ten minutes ago. Huh? Where did you send him? I sent him nowhere. A uh, pair now, Monsieur. Uh, thanks. Now, did you recognise the dead girl from the photo in the papers? Oh, I don't often bother with the papers. When she came in here on the night of her death, was the place full? Monday? Oh, very full. At about one o'clock. I didn't look at my watch. Uh, what did she do? She sat down on the stool at the end of the bar. Mm. Did she order a drink? Yeah, I think it was uh, rum. And she asked if you had a letter for her? Yeah, that's right. Where did you keep the letter? Uh, there, between those bottles. Uh, nobody asks for them. And so you gave it to her? No, I asked to see her identity card. Ah, yes, those were your instructions. They were. From Jimmy? From Jimmy. Did you tell Inspector Longion this? Most of it, if he asked. So you gave her the letter once she'd identified herself? That's right. 
Her identity card was in her handbag, was it? Where else? A small silver evening bag with a chain. I don't remember. Did she open and read the letter in the bar? No, she went downstairs. Uh, where the toilets and the telephones are. Hmm. And then she came back. Yeah, uh, to the bar. Hmm. And ordered another drink. No, the American did for her. The American? Not Jimmy? Mm, not Jimmy. Uh, a tall, young chap uh, with a lot of red hair. Uh, did this tall, red-haired American have a name? Frank. He uh, used to follow Jimmy around. But when Jimmy went back to the States, Frank stayed here. Well, he was here that night. And he picked Louise up. Did she seem to mind? She let him buy her a couple of drinks and they talked. Did they leave together? Yeah. What time? Oh, I guess I'd say um, coming up to two. Mm. Have you seen this tall, red-haired American since that night? Oh, he hasn't been in this bar. Have you any idea where he is? I told old Lonyo. The American asked me about Brussels. He said he was going there. Mm. He wanted to know about an hotel. I told him I always stayed at the palace by the guard you know. I see. Get your coat, Albert. Lock up the bar. You're coming with me to the Quai des Orfèvres. Do you want Albert Falcone in now, Chief? Yes, Chambier. Have you traced Longyon in Brussels? Yes, Chief. He's uh, at the Palace Hotel. <laughs> and he's not found the American? No. Not one that fits the description, Chief. Mm. I didn't tell him there wasn't one, but I think he guesses. I only said you'd made an arrest. Oh, that went down like a lead balloon, I'm sure. He, he didn't ask who, just said he'd get the night train back. Uh. I'll bring our friend Albert in. Mm. Yes, it'll take me a long time to live this down in all your eyes. It was his own dark fault believing stories about tall, red-haired Americans rushing off to Brussels to find them. But it'll be me who'll feel responsible. And guilty. Here he is, Chief. Ah, uh, come and sit down, Aubert. No, you stay, jean and shut the door. Right, Chief. Now, Aubert, the truth... How did you guess? I didn't guess. I knew at once. I would have swallowed your story. It was a good one. If I hadn't known the girl. You knew the girl? Knew Louise Labouin? After her death, Albert, I... got to know her. To know her well enough to be sure she would never have behaved in your bar as you said she did. No, Albert, Louise would not have sat at the bar as other girls do. She would never have considered going downstairs, fighting her way through the crowd to read the letter. She wouldn't even have thought to open it until she was outside. I nearly said home, but she didn't have a home to go to. And finally, she would never have allowed a man to pick her up, buy her drinks, take her off. Not even a tall, red-haired young American, Albert. No. She slipped into the bar, seeing nobody ordered a drink and took it to a table. Drank it slowly without paying attention to anybody. Then she went back to the bar, ordered another drink, asked you, Albert, for the letter, showing her identity card. You gave it to her and you probably said, don't open it here, although you had no need to. She took the letter and the drink back to the table. I think she felt something was wrong. She would. She felt threatened and she had to have one or two more drinks before she could find the courage to leave. So she was a little drunk. And her senses were not so prickly when she left. Probably to find a cheap hotel for the night. You know the rest. You must have been there. I have been since her death. What did the letter say, Albert? It was from her father. He asked her to forgive him for his neglect of her, and he said he'd be dead by the time she received this letter. He went on to tell her to get a passport, 
go to the United States to an address in New York where there was a great deal of money awaiting her in banknotes. But as nobody knew her, she must turn up with the letter and her passport. You have the letter? All you needed was her identity card to get a passport in her name. We didn't mean to kill her. No. I'm sure you didn't. Who were the others? Bianchi, the Corsican, and Tattoo Jack. Oh. Well, they were outside in a car. They let her get on a bit, drove past her, stopped, and waited for her to come up to them. Bianchi got out of the car and made a grab at her handbag, but the chain on it was around her wrist, so he tried to pull it free. She struggled, fell on her knees. Well, she looked as if she'd screamed, so Bianchi slapped her face. All she did was cling on to him and start moaning for help, so the fool lost his nerve and coshed her. But too hard. He didn't mean to kill her, but he's a big chap. I know he is. So they bundled her into the car got the handbag and dumped her out at the Place Fantimi. Why there? That's what I asked. They said, dressed like she was, she fitted the Montmartre district, fitted in with the girls. Yes. I suppose she did. Poor kid, she was always a loser. If that evening bag had not had a change. All right, take him away, jean -Bier. Yes, Chief. Oh, Albert, I nearly forgot. I owe you for the pair now. <laughs> Have it on the house. No, I'd rather not. Yes. Keep the change. Oh, thank you, monsieur. The end of a sad case, George. Yes, indeed. I take it you tied it up at the American end? The FBI did, but only just in time. When the girl used to impersonate Louise turned up to collect, the FBI were waiting. It was a lot of money. Louise could have bought herself a new life. With a new dress? Yes, a new dress. Even crime didn't pay for Louise. I take it Longnon arrived back from Brussels in one piece. <laughs> I didn't wait around to see. Uh, what you mean is you were coward enough to keep out of the way. Well, I did have some leave owing, but Longnon's report was a joy. In what particular way? He never for a moment admitted he was sent on a fool's errand. Perhaps he still believes in the tall, red-haired American. Have you never asked him? Oh, you must be joking. You were quite right, of course. To discover how poor Louise died, you had to know how she lived. And if Longnon had understood that, he'd never have rushed off to Brussels. Mm. She's haunted me for a long time, was that girl. I walked past Romero's the other day, and her ghost was there. In that sad blue dress and badly fitting cape. Like a sulky child, out past her bedtime.